Hi, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Robin Gavon. I'm the senior critic at large for the Washington Post. And it is my pleasure to welcome this afternoon, uh, Diane von Furstenberg. She is the veteran designer, uh, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and a longtime supporter of women's leadership. Uh, Diane, welcome to Washington Post Live. It's nice to have Thank you back. You. Thank you. It's very nice to be back. So I thought I would start by uh, just sort of noting that yesterday was International Women's Day, and you have published your eighth book, and it's called Own It, The Secret to Life. So I guess the question is, is the secret to life owning all of your strengths and weaknesses and flaws and everything? Is that the secret? Well, I actually, you know, when I started this whole in charge, you know, I start, well, we should start with the in charge. People, you know, when people ask me, what did you want to do when you were little? And I said, I did not know what I wanted to do, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be. And I wanted to be a woman in charge. And then people would say, who do you dress for? And I always say the woman in charge. So in charge was always been like the big umbrella of how for the woman I wanted to be, for the women, for all women, how I wanted them to be and so on. And two years ago for International Women's Day, I, I launched this, this little movement in charge and I did my, you know, with micro steps and things like that. And then I realized that, uh, so then Fadon, the publisher came and they said, you know, we do so well with guidebooks, with books of advice, with quotes, mm -hmm. and people quote you all the time. Uh, you say you want to be an oracle, blah, blah, blah. So um, <laughs> w would you do a book called In Charge? And I thought, okay, great. So I started to write and I remember First, I started to write it as a prose, and the first sentence I wrote was, um, we cannot choose our parents, which is clear, and, but it's kind of a shock when you read that and say, oh, that's true. And so what that means is that if you cannot choose where you come from, you cannot choose your parents, you just got to own it, right? You got to accept it. And, and then somehow the in charge is, I, then I try to explain what in charge is, is. And in charge is first and foremost, it's not an aggressive thing. It's first and foremost, a commitment to, yourself, to ourselves. It's owning who we are. And therefore the own, you own your imperfection, they become your asset. You own your vulnerability, it turns into your strength. And then own it became, became really the answer for everything and everyone. And you could apply it to a child, you can apply it to um, your boyfriend leaving you, to being diagnosed with cancer, to a flood in your bathroom. All of it is, um, is just about owning the moment and what is happening. And by the, mo by the time you own it, then, then you are dealing with it. And so, I thought, okay, own it. And then I wrote The Secret of Life, but then I hated that. I said, oh, no, no, I can't say that. And then my friend Sam Altman from LA said, no, no, call it Secret to Life. And that was very, I was very happy. So at first it was a prose. And then I kept on reading it and I thought it was boring and I thought it was condescending. And then I decided, oh, I'm going to do it as a dictionary. And I had a big, my big diary, and every page was a letter. And I wrote the words that spoke to me, or some words that don't speak to me. And then I started writing about every word, like a dictionary. And some words is just a tiny definition, and some word is a little anecdote. But all of it comes back to own it. But in some ways, it sounds like a, a huge part of it is the idea of taking responsibility for
for right. where you're going, where right. and and how um, and how you sort of make a, a choice, make a decision about how you're going to get there. That's you right. Know. That's right. It's an inventory, and it's it's at the end, it's all about the truth. And you know, when I always always say the most important relationship in life is the one we have with ourselves, because once we have that, any other relationship is a plus and not a must. And I cannot say that enough. I mean, by my children, I mean, I say once more own it, and I think they will disinherit me. I mean, it's, it's, uh, but it works for everything and it forces you to be true to yourself, be the best of yourself, not being delusional, mm -hmm. and, and, and do the best. And, um, it is the secret. So I stand by it. I'm perfectly, perfectly happy. I stand by it. Own it is it's, the secret to life. The timing is is also really interesting because the last, I, I would say, probably five to six years have been uh, times of incredible both uh, advancement and upheaval in the lives of women, ranging from, uh, you know, the Me Too movement to the recent uh, rise of uh, a female vice president. I mean, when you look at sort of the landscape of women over the last, you know, five to ten years, how do you, how do you assess things? I mean, how where do you think? Um, uh, well, it, it, it's it's a combination of both. You know, uh, women are advancing, but during COVID, I mean, do you know the most dangerous place for women to be in the world? Where's that? Home. The most, most, most women are killed in their home. I mean, in France, the, the domestic violence, right? And that is very scary because that's just so scary that today, in in I shouldn't say civilized country, but in, I mean in countries where we 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 believe in our education and everything, that you know home is a dangerous place for women to be. I mean that that's not cool. Having said that, we are making a lot of progress. We have a woman vice president. We have more and more women running countries, and and uh, but uh, this. There's still a lot to do, and that's why I cannot, you know, now that I'm an older woman, it's more and more important for me to use my voice, my knowledge, my experience, my connections, and my resource, and my resources to help women to be the women they want to be, and, uh, and that is really the most important Thing that at this point I want to do, and I do it in many ways, you know. But mm -hmm. and uh, and I realize that with experience now, I know how to push the little button inside women that that is called confidence. And even with my clothes, I do that. So the good thing about this book, by the time I was finished with it, and by the time I I read it, and you know. When you have to write a little definition, words are so important. I was pleased, if I can say, with myself because I realized that actually, somehow, I've always been very honest with myself. And that has been, I think, the reason why I was always able to survive the difficulties and the challenges and go up the ups and downs of life. And um, and so that's that's very important. And if I can share that, and if I can, and the only way you can actually share that is when you share your vulnerabilities, when you share your your weaknesses, because it's not inspiring for people if you talk about your success. I mean, may, uh, but what is inspiring is you tell the stories. Um, because, for example, sometimes you are at the peak of your success, and yet you yourself know you're not, because there are things that no one else knows that are happening, that are happening. 
And, and it's important for, <clears throat> for people to know that. And the same way that sometimes people say, oh, she's a has-been, that may not be true either because you already yeah. have a plan for coming back. One of the, the challenges certainly during the pandemic has been uh, the toll that it's taken on uh, women in the workforce. Uh, some, many of them have left to take care of family, uh, right. but also they're experiencing uh, many of the, the same job losses that, that men are as well. And you've been really um, out front in talking about your own challenges with your business. Yes. Um, which um, has, was, was hit by some of the, the ravages of COVID. Can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, where the business is now and how you're thinking about your way forward? Yes, so at the beginning of COVID last year <clears throat> was a difficult time. First of all, um, a lot of the companies, a lot of fashion companies, and certainly mine, I had uh, uh, given a lot of trust to someone who spent a lot of money and got me into so many stores and outlets and things I really didn't want to do. And so that was very costly and it was very, it was very destructive. So when uh, the COVID happened and, and a furlough and all of those things, I thought to myself, this is the moment to take a toll and to just look at everything and take a, um, decide what to do, you know? And um, it's like, <clears throat> and owning it really, what is right, what is not right, and what is, what should be the business model, the new business model. And then I, I also talked to a lot of people. There were some people who would have, who wanted to buy my company, who is all, which has always been um, private. And then I realized that what they wanted to buy, what they were buying, they were buying the name, but they were buying the archives, they were buying the library of prints, the 45 years of contents. And I realized what a huge uh, vault I had, you know? And uh, so I realized that, no, I did not want to sell and I, I wanted to work it differently. And I did, and, and it was very hard because then, you know, newspaper would call because I was closing stores. Are you going bankrupt? Are you going this? And, and I kept on saying, listen, I cannot answer you because whatever I say in the morning may not be the same, may not be the same at night or the next day. So all I can tell you, I it was with Vanessa, is that I am happy to, to share the difficulty because I know a lot of other people are having difficulty and I want to let them know that they shouldn't have shame. They shouldn't, you know, they should just own it and make the best they can and, uh, and go back to their core. And, um, and actually we had a very, very interesting year and a very interesting year. And, it's almost all done, and uh, and uh, so I'm excited. I'm excited the way I uh, dealt with everything, and I think we're coming out very very nicely, very clean, and very focused on um, on what this brand is about, and focusing to the core of it. I mean, so much of the brand is wrapped up in in you, in your identity, in your um, in in your legacy. And I I know that you know there it must have been challenging having to lay off staff. And I mean, there were some concerns that people didn't get full severance and all of that. It was that wasn't true at all. That wasn't we 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 did I be, we behaved very well. But <clears throat> at the time I was just trying to ask you just sort of emotionally when you have to sort of grapple with all of that, um, you know, the business aspect, but also the fact that in many ways you are the business. How do you sort through all of that? 
you got to own it. I mean, you're responsible. Your name is on the door. Uh, I am, you know, it's, it's, you, you deal with the truth. I mean, there is no other ways to deal but dealing with the truth and doing the best you can and, and being decent to people and obviously and doing, you know, your, your responsibility and all of that. But um, there's no other thing than dealing with the truth. And, and, you know, going bankrupt was a possibility. And I wanted to know that it was a possibility. And um, I didn't have to go that way. But, I mean, it's about owning it. It's... It's just you have to deal with the truth, whatever the truth is. As, as you move forward, I know several of the things that are um, sort of swirling within the fashion industry, like so many other industries, uh, include the issue of inclusivity and diversity. Um, how do you sort of see that playing a role in the company as you move forward? Well, I mean, to be inclusive is, is, you know, it's so, I don't know. I mean, you know, even in this little book, for example, I never use the word you or yourself, but I always use us or we or ourselves because the minute I don't include myself in it, I feel condescending. And that goes, you know, inclusiveness is also, is, is being part of, of people and humanity and all of that. And um, I don't know, for me, it's, um, for me, it's something that, uh, that is, is just part of what you have to do. I mean, so. Um, I try to be uh, as good as a person as I possibly can, and uh, I pay attention to details. I pay attention to people. I try to um, do good. I make a point of uh, calling. You know, every morning I have two emails that I'm supposed to do that don't benefit myself at all, and using my magic wand. And now it's it's become like a sport, and uh, and it's 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 wonderful because the more you use your magic wand, the more powerful your magic wand is, and at the end it comes back as a boomerang. So I don't know if it, you see, inclusiveness is also that. It's also it's it's com it's compassion, it's empathy, but it's also putting yourself in, in other people's skin. Do you think that, I mean, you, you, you're such an advocate, as you said, for owning it and taking responsibility and being willing to show uh, vulnerability. How challenging is that at a time when people uh, are often so quickly taken to task for a mistake or um, you know an, an ill an ill phrased sentence. Um. My advice is always own it, apologize, explain it, but be responsible. Whatever it is, and yes, sometimes it can be a mistake, and sometimes it doesn't mean that. But then say it. I mean, you know, when you bring things forward before others do, somehow you neutralize it. This, even when you negotiate or when you, or if you want to be hired for a job or you're trying to sell something, and you always kind of think, okay, what is the negative that they think about me? And if you bring it out first, then somehow you have a better chance of neutralizing it. And it's the same thing. I mean, you know, owning it is being responsible. And being responsible is being responsible of your action and being responsible of what you've said. And, uh, and uh, nobody's perfect. And, and then if you're not perfect, then admit it. 
But what is unacceptable is abuse. It is the abuse. You could be, sometimes you could be inappropriate. I mean, <clears throat> I remember when I, I was young and things like that. But what is not acceptable is the abuse of power. When people abuse the power that they have over you because they are your boss or like that. That's, that's just not acceptable. And, and, and we have to change that. And uh, are, they, are they casualties amongst, the, amongst it? Yes, I'm sure they are casualties. But overall, people were abusive. And to be abusive, <clears throat> to be a violent, abusive, or I mean, the three things that you've, we have to fight is violence, abuse, and inequality. And that is just what we have to fight against, period. And inequality, there's a lot of work to do there, a lot of work, more and more. And COVID did not help. And uh, that, is the, that is going to be a, a major issue. And as a family, I know that it's something that we are taking seriously and that we want to do something about. One of the other aspects that the fashion industry is grappling with is uh, the issue of climate change. And I wanted to bring in a, a reader question here. Um, it's from Karen Stout from Arizona, uh, which is, how do you see the fashion industry surviving and thriving without becoming an even greater contributing factor in climate change? That is true. That is <clears throat> absolutely true. Uh, and uh, the key is try not, you know, is not make things that are going to be thrown away and uh, that will fill landfills. Um, you know, I, I uh, when people talk about sustainability, I, um, <laughs> what can I tell you? Uh, dresses that I design. 45 years ago are still being sold uh, over and over, sometimes by three generation, and they still don't have holes, and they're still... Um, so I think that that's one way. I mean, you don't want to... I mean, you don't want to create junk. I mean, I know that I have become so allergic to plastic myself that... Um, it is a concern, and it is a concern, and what also is a concern is that we cannot constantly look for growth and more and more and more, and um, it is a concern for sure. So yeah, it sounds like you're advocating a completely, a complete change in the way that the industry thinks about uh, what it means to, um, as you said, to grow a company, but also what it means to create product. Because for so long, uh, the fundamental mantra of fashion was new, 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 always on to the next thing, yeah. next season. Exactly. And I am not, I'm not like that, actually. Um, <clears throat> I try to think that in terms of my brand and my company, I always put the woman first. I mean, some that was, I mean, everybody has their own little role in fashion. My role in fashion was the woman. It was always the woman. I created, you know, clothes. I mean, when I created my first dresses, or every other designer said, What is that? And they were right. What is that? Little, they look like nothing. But when women would put them on, all of a sudden, their body language changed, <clears throat> their body changed, and but yet they were dressed properly. So that's again why I think it's important to go to your core. I always say to the young designers who work for, with me, I always say, you know, collectibles. DVF is supposed to be collectibles. You don't throw them away. Mothers don't throw their dresses. Grandmothers, I mean, I know because I buy a lot of um, old ones. I have huge archives and they keep them. So 
um, so we, I mean, that's part of what the, the brand has to go back, go back to your core and don't, I mean, it's like, I mean, I've said this for years. I was still at the CFDA. I mean, in the world that everything is instant and now for people to be exposed and to show things that they will only have six months from now, this doesn't seem like it makes any sense. Um, you know, many things don't seem like they make sense anymore. And that's why catastrophe happens, wars, pandemics, earthquakes, climate change, because at some point we can't keep on pushing and pushing and pushing and, you know, sinking everything there is from the planet. So, I mean, we have, well, we, we, yeah. I wanted to ask you one sort of non-fashion related question, which, and, and one sort of non-book related question, but one I think you are a bit of an expert on because you, at one point, married a prince. And one of the big topics right now is that Meghan Markle, uh, Prince Harry interview. I, I'm just curious to get your sense of the different reaction uh, that people had in the U.S. versus in in Europe, were you were you surprised? What are you What are you? I don't know. What, what have they said and in you Europe? And you know them. <laughs> huh? And and you what know them. They? Well, I know Meghan. I knew her before, and I know Prince Harry briefly, but I know him. And uh, I I I watched the interview. I was touched by her honesty. She was absolutely honest. She was absolutely, her honesty and her candor were very real. And his, uh, his, he was, I mean, I, you cannot forget that he was a little boy of nine years old when his mother died because they were running away from paparazzi. So, and there was this little note, I remember the little drawing and the note that he had written his mother on the funeral. For me, that's what I kept on thinking about. And uh, I liked it. I thought Oprah did a great job. I thought they were honest. And I think, you know what? I think it will be useful. I think it will, I think it will be useful. So I was, I know a lot of people I know. Oh, I'm they sorry, were how, how do you mean uh, useful for the, the, the palace, the monarchy, or just sort of the culture in general? The culture in general. Uh, it would be useful because, I mean, you know, I mean, this thing about the tone of, of the skin, I mean, I, I, you know what? People should know that. Because it's unacceptable. Because it's 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 and and so that's why I think it should it will be useful. Were you surprised by remarks like that? No, I could feel it. I could see it. You know, I was a little Jewish girl who married a German prince. So I know the feeling. You know, I remember the first time I went to the. Fürstenberg Castle. I was afraid to eat. I thought they would poison me, but of course they didn't. And they were very nice to me. But uh, it's uh, I know I know how it feels. I mean, not quite that much, but you know I know how it feels. And um, but but it's beautiful. They look like a beautiful couple, and he cares about her, and she cares about him, and and. Uh, I know a lot of people were judging it even before they spoke, even before the interview. And I said, how can you do that? Listen. And I thought they were fine. I thought they were absolutely uh, honest and, 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 and it was touching. What did you think? I, I found it fascinating. And I, I have to say, I did not realize that Buckingham Palace had a human resources department. So that surprised me. Oh, uh, that they I'm, did. Yeah. I'm, and they were... I'm so sorry to say that we are out of time. And I would love to keep going and going. But uh, we have to wrap it up. 
And I would just like to say, Diane von Furstenberg, thank you so much uh, for coming back to Washington Post Live. And also thank you all for tuning in. And I would just like to let you know that on Thursday at 1130, uh, we'll be back with the president of General Motors, Mark Roos. And at three o'clock, you can hear from the Houston police chief and head of the police executive research forum about the rise in violent crime across the country. Once again, I'm Robin Gavon, and thank you so much for joining Washington Post Live. Okay.